All right. Shall we? Okay. Do you want to be on the right or the left? Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm Annie. I'm Nat. Um, we work on uh, many performance-related projects. You, you know me as the tracing geek. Perf sheriffing. Yeah. Like, we usually come up and talk about that sort of thing, but we thought we'd try something new. Um, we... we have always split off tooling and measuring from actually going faster. And we thought we'd try a different thing, which is actually talk about making Chrome faster. Uh, we're doing a lot, um, but we've never really kind of tried to pull it together into saying, like, how are we actually making Chrome faster for our users? Yeah, so. That's, that's kind of our plan for today. You know, why do we do fast? So when Chrome's slow, our users notice they, they really don't like it. Uh, they consider different browsers, content blockers, uh, they tweet and just they're overall pretty bummed out. Yeah, I mean, it, this is the sort of thing where, you know, even though it's New York Times that's bad or it's Forbes that's bad or Forbes is serving an ad, this is going to reflect badly on, on Chrome and it causes kind of bad consequences back onto the, the platform that we're trying to make good. Um, so, you know, these are failure modes and, and, and we want to do better there. So what does good look like? I mean... Uh, you know, who knows if this is actually going to play. I have no idea how to play this video, but you all have seen this. This is the passive event listeners demo. You've seen these side by sides. I know Sammy, you know, you know, made this happen originally, which is he'll get it to the point where uh, you get these two side by side phones and it's fast on one side and it's slow on the other side. Look but what do we mean by fast? If this you see is why on you have the right? PMs. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. On the right, you can see that like, as soon as they touch the glass, it just scrolls. It's, it feels correct. Everything feels right. It's, it's almost just like delightful. Yeah, and you know, it's actually kind of sad how many projects we launch that don't have a connection back up to this user delight moment. You know, um, this, this one had a, had a kind of clear connection to user delight, but we've done hundreds of projects over the last year, two years, where we didn't actually connect it back up. I think... It would be great if, you know, over the course of the next two, three years, we actually do more of our performance work in a way that's directly connected to happiness of our users. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know, aspirational, right? Um, and now it's not going forward, Drew. Come on, man. You see, don't put videos. You see, I wanted this, this calming cat, right? So, like... So, how do we actually go fast? How, how do we get that performance wins that, that we're sure connect up to the Yeah, users. you know, there's always that person who's like, how hard can this be? <laughs> right? And you're like, I don't know. Um, so it's hard. It, you oh, know, the way we've gone fast over the years is we've tuned for raw performance. And, and Jochen talked about this this morning, right? It's go faster, bigger engine. Yeah, just take what we have and make it faster and faster and faster. And we've done that lots and lots and lots. And we've had really cool optimizations. And it's not like that we're done doing that. But like, you know, around about the time that we started going to mobile, maybe 2013, 2012, 2014, whatever, it started becoming clear that there is actually more that we've got to do. You know, there isn't this world of infinite performance available to us. Yeah, th there's um, big problems in that. Like now, uh, for a long time, people's computers just kept getting faster and faster and faster. And now we're seeing mobile phones, and the, the users, the new users that are coming online are, are using slower and slower mobile phones. They're memory constrained, they're battery constrained, in addition to being CPU constrained. We have to think about trade offs. Yeah. So, you know, what we've done is, you know, we've talked about rail, we've talked about actual, you know, perceptual based performance, right? Which is the scrolling that we do. It's all about doing what feels fast for the user. We haven't necessarily prioritized um, you know, raw performance over the years. We've actually done stuff like get the scrolling to happen on the compositor thread, you know, prioritize the scheduling of input events so that those happen first. This happened, but we didn't really talk about our performance strategy overall of like, well, what does this mean for our overall performance like, goal of like, Chrome should be delightful. <laughs> what does this mean? Um, uh, so, you know, we have done this. We've talked about interventions. That's clearly part of our new world, right? You can stop collisions before they happen. Yeah, but interventions have their problems too, right? The, they break our contract with the web developer to make, to make a, the user experience better. They're not a really long-term strategy. They're more of like a survival technique. Yeah, and we've talked about survival tactics in the past. Um, so, you know, intervention's really, really important. And in fact, really important for the next couple of years especially. But I don't think that is our, our long-term way of making the web faster. You know, just very concretely, when we go throw a touch um, passive listener to intervention on, on the half the web, we're going to fix responsiveness, and there's going to be a lot of short-term win. But the reason that we had to do that, which is large JS running on the main thread, that hasn't gone away. And that's just lurking there, 
sort of always kind of cropping up in problematic areas. So, you know, just intervening and just going raw for performance does not a strategy make. So what is our strategy? Uh, so we looked at the performance projects. We did a survey. A lot of you answered. Thank you. There, there's 96 web platform performance projects going on right now. Like right now, all, all, all active. Maybe two yeah. or three aren't active. I was kind of surprised at how many there were. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are raw. Some of them are raw, raw performance. Some of them are interventions. But a lot of them are kind of, yeah, we couldn't quite figure out the word. It, I think trying to convince ourselves of how this all fits together, you can look at the history of cars. So Dimitri came up with this really cool analogy about smarter engines and cars, and so we actually went and like researched car engines. Because I'm not exactly like the automotive type. Sorry. But, but we learned, uh, like good Googlers. Um, <laughs> so for the last 300 zillion years, uh, F1 engines have gotten faster and more powerful. Uh, and they've done that via various configuration changes, more cylinders, more liters, more uh, the turbocharger charger raters, things like that. It, but basically, it's all been about power, about bigger spark, about more oxygen to the engine, right? It, it didn't really change, you know, even up to 2000, right? It was basically the same old game. But then around 2009, they started putting uh, limits on how much fuel you could use. Yeah, and, and you know, this was kind of born out of, you know, the fuel fuel economy kind of changes. But this had really interesting short-term implications. There were people sitting there going, well, how do we get to this new fuel limit for these race cars? Um, ah, we'll do the Prius thing. We'll do regenerative braking, right? So they're like, okay, we'll do that. And maybe we'll brake even. It won't be faster, but it'll be kind of like, okay, yeah, it'll be good. This is 2008, you know, nine, a, a long while ago. And they did not indeed achieve kind of break-even performance. But then they realized, you know, regenerative braking, regenerating energy when you're braking, and that's actually like the hardest part in a race car to make it go faster is like right after you brake, you want to go fast. So the whole trick, as we learned, is, you know, after, after the uh, curve, your uh, turbocharger doesn't have a lot of power because what's happening is turbochargers are driven by exhaust energy on your, on your uh, engine. And when you're at low RPMs, you have very low efficiency. So the cleverness, the smartness that they came up with was, hey, we've got all this power saved up from braking. Let's use that to spin the turbocharger. And all of a sudden, this whole thing that was about break-even performance became about, whoa, these things are way the hell faster. And they feel faster. Because they have much better characteristics in the places that used to be crappy. So analogy, right? Or whatever the heck it is, metaphor, <laughs> I don't know. The thing, it's this thing feels a whole hell of a lot like what we're going through in the web. It's, and then if you throw in the, the you know, crash detection crap in there too, it, smarts seem to pay off a lot. And they seem to pay off in surprising ways over time. Um, you go from the old Brutus style car, this is a hilarious episode on Top Gear if you haven't seen it, to the modern you know, race, race car. There's some really neat shifts there. And I think what we're doing in, in the web platform, aside from interventions and aside from pure performance work, is actually making our engine smarter. And it's not just about efficiency, there's probably a whole lot more lurking behind the scenes that we're yet to discover. Yeah. So how are we going to build a smarter engine? We yeah. certainly have a lot of parts. Yeah, and like some of them are smart already, and some of them are kind of dumb. Yeah. Some of them need like a kick in the face. Um, yeah, I'm looking at Raster Worker. Um, I wonder which part that is. Also, this is called knolling. It's a fascinating thing to Google. There's like this whole like subculture of people who disassemble things. Google. Um, <laughs> how are we going to do this? Um, you've seen this slide this morning. Yeah. So Dimitri came up with a plan of action for us. Uh, we, we love it, right? Break your work into small chunks, make the chunks as thin as they can possibly be, and then build smarts, right, to so, make so, sure you're running them well. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of the no-fail strategy, but it's sort of like, look, the, the enemy number one is us having too much work to do, right? We have a finite amount of compute power. We have a finite amount of bandwidth. We have a finite amount of power, uh, you know, actual, like, energy power, battery power. Um, we should do what matters. And the way to do that is to break things up into point, points of schedulability or points of control. And it's not really about scheduling. And in fact, it's important to note that this isn't just about scheduling. Early thinking here was that, oh, the scheduler is the, the universal answer to you know, life, liberty, happiness. But there, I mean, and the scheduler was amazing, the Blink scheduler, but there's a lot of really, really cool smart projects that are totally different than that. Like V8 right now, they're trying to break down 
uh, when you're executing that, which rail stage are you in? And, and based on that, like kind of figure out what the user expectation might be. Yeah, I mean, really cool things are like the document dot write stuff is absolutely crazy, right? Where you're actually executing the snippet of a JavaScript in an isolated world on the preload scanner thread. I mean, it's completely wacky, but it's kind of completely wacky, like the idea of let's generate electricity when you break. Um, it's good wacky. It's smartness. Yeah, when we were thinking about intersection observer, I think everybody was like ads, 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 ads. But there's a super cool optimization to keep just 1,000 elements on the page. You get lazy elements where you use the intersection observer to decide whether the element's on screen, and you don't even create its children until it's on screen. It's cool stuff. I mean, is it perfect? Yeah, I don't know. But this is kind of surprising. Ooh, this is way better. Kind of things that come from first starting out smart. Uh, have we hit the? Have we kind of hammered that home yet? I hope we're kind of convincing you that like smartness is part of our total portfolio. Um, but that's not kind of the only part of the, the talk, right? We have a whole other thing. We yeah, so you can't just about. all go home, be smarter. Yeah, yay. <laughs> There's some pieces missing. We've seen a lot of people try to do this project, you know, to do these projects. The scheduler team is, is chief among them, but say trim, um, where they're, they're trying to be smart. And it turns out that being, building smarter engine kind of technology bumps up against knowledge and a lot of different kinds of knowledge that we don't have in Chrome. And so it's hard to really go into the state of the art. Yeah, so here's you, our... Y'all have probably seen <laughs> our points. We're going we're gonna to hit all these points kind of in a lot of detail. Um, so bear with, right? The first one is the missing goalposts. Uh, so do you want to talk about rail? Uh, you know, y you all seen us talk about rail. Like rail is this thing. We tried to write a, an algorithm to actually go from, from the rail model to an actual score of like how well are you doing rail. And I, I talked about that at last BlinkOn. It... Still seems possible to do it, but what we found is there are a whole lot of teams in blank. This is sort of a non-technical reason that we're stalled there. This is uh, a kind of a short list of metrics. On the perf dashboard, we have a couple uh, tens of thousands more. But like these are the these are the metrics that every team that I found is listing as their primary metrics that they're shipping against. One of the interesting things is every single team has a different metric. Um, so when we go saying, "Hey, here's this new thing called Rail," we have to wean everybody off of these. And everybody here is doing a different thing. And all these things are actually really good signals, by the way. Like paint team tracking paint time in microseconds is a really good thing. But again, that's not a user-first metric. It's just a thing. It's a, it's a thing about our internals, right? It's, it's the O2 sensor level in an engine, not the speed of the car, right, or the uh, miles per gallon. Um, so Paul Irish has been driving us toward this sort of more user-facing set of metrics that we're hoping to make as an incremental step toward measuring rail and sort of measuring user satisfaction. So each one of these is a user-centric metric. You can see the, the um, loading metrics up at the top. The first contentful pane, like when did something just flash on the screen? The first meaningful pane is, is helping, like when did the user actually be able to like read this page? On the time the first interaction, when the, can the, the, the user scroll or click? That it's all very user focused, and so are the rest of the metrics that, that we're looking at. So, for example, the wow moment that we started off with with the video, right? That's an input latency sort of thing. So, like users notice that the the page is, is responsive, that it responds quickly, and if you if you do some optimization that affects that, people are going to be directly and positively impacted. Um, you know, we're trying to get. We've been looking at like all of the metrics, and and Paul's leaving a session on this tomorrow. But we're trying to get to a point where there there really are kind of a handful, this is uh, seven or eight, I think we go back and forth, but like handful of metrics that kind of cover speed in total that we can say, look, if, you, if you're hitting all of these, you're actually, you're actually doing pretty good by the user. And the tail end of this is in fact us trying to get more teams to use these as their tracking metrics. Not abandon your existing ones, but actually take these on as your, your success metrics. Um, so get involved now so that you can influence them, <laughs> uh, not, not later on when you don't want them. Um, talk to Paul. So beyond just having like clear goalposts, uh, a smart engine needs like a lot of data. And look at all the purple. It's like a lot of purple. So a team that did this really, really well was like uh, Memory Infra and Project Trim. What they did was they spent a long time really gathering very deep details about where Chrome is actually using memory instead of just trying to hack away and do some quick optimizations. And they found a lot of surprises and uh, broke a lot of expectations. I mean, some of our early estimates and understandings of performance, or well, memory in this case, were off by 2x, you know, 3x. Or there were things where we thought that there was this big deal around the string thing, and it turned out that that didn't really amount to much. Um, 
those of you who know about this know that this is a huge amount of work just to get to the point that we have intelligence about memory. You know, a huge group of people in Tokyo trying to use the data and provide feedback, and then a huge group of people in London trying to do all the instrumentation to make, us, make it possible to have this. This is a huge amount of work, but now we're at this point where we, we think we're going to tip, tip into a really nice sort of return on investment, where we're going to see things like the memory coordinator, where we see a lot of upside uh, in, that, in that project. And it's all about saying, no, there isn't one size fits all memory policy for Chrome. It's in fact that you should pick the right memory policy based on what's happening at this moment. And, and that's only possible by having this sort of baseline set of intelligence that we can then use over and over and over again. Another example is input dev trying to break down uh, when you do scroll on the main thread, what blocks it. Uh, spoiler alert, there's some script. Yeah, I mean, input dev is, is heavily based around, their strategy is heavily based around um, interventions right now, and rightly so, because uh, some of the script stuff is really hard to budge. Um, but, you know, in the total, totality of time, I think we're going to need to actually attack this script problem head on and say, look, this, this has got to not become so ridiculous. And that means all of a sudden it becomes all of our problem, V8 team's problem, DevRel talking. It's a, it's a big problem ahead of us. Um, we need to do this, um, and the data show it. And speaking of V8, uh, historically they have been looking at uh, just regular benchmarks like SunSpider or Octane, and they've shifted focus in the last several months to really trying to look at real web pages and very deeply understand what V8 is doing. Uh, this, this data was really transformative, I think, because it, it showed kind of this notion of, um, uh, and this came out of the V8 uh, team, this shows this notion of like there's CPU time and it's being shared by different components. And it really gets to this point of we need to be able to see who's fighting over the thread, who's using these precious resources. This is very much kind of an economy sort of way of looking at things. It's, it clearly points at callback. Oh my God, what's all this callback stuff, right? Um, out of this jumps all sorts of optimization ideas and all sorts of priority statements that we can use to do a better job of making smart decisions and making faster decisions. But we could, could that put that in more context. Oh, sorry. So uh, backing up. Yeah. yeah. So the problem is like all these teams are doing really great work, but they're spending all this time having to wire in all these different things. And from our side, we, we, see, we see a lot of wires, like wires everywhere. Like the cost of each of those analyses, we just showed three. There's another one where we successfully got frame blaming working to study ads. But like the cost of each one of these uh, gaining intelligence sufficient to do smart things is really quite disturbing. It's tens of people, it's fives of people for many, many quarters. And, and at the end, you end up with this crazy wiring harness in the tail end. Uh, it's scary because we aren't yet at a point of complete or even partial understanding of where performance is going in the, in the web. And then on our end, uh, we haven't been the, the greatest citizens in the, the making lots of wires camps. We've been uh, really working hard on figuring out like what is the best way to get the data and collect the data and have it usable for people. But we've made a lot of different things along the way and it can be really hard to understand what, what all this stuff is. So you've probably been blocked at one point or another on one of these things, you know, be it TBM2 or you've used it. Um, what we've been trying to do is come up with some solution that, that we think can hold wind and actually support um, all, all of the Chrome team and especially the web platform team in building smarter engines, being intelligent about, about the performance that we, we, we choose to battle. Um, we've actually hit a pretty big uh, threshold as of like last night where enough of kind of our vision is coming together that we feel ready to kind of introduce Catapult. So you've seen us checking in to a lot of directory, this directory for a while, but we never really explained what we we're doing here. So now it's there. <laughs> uh, so our big main goal with Catapult is to be able to take all these wires and have a, a, a place for them to go. And, and basically for, for all of you that are performance experts in your specific area, make it so that you can write metrics and then everyone can leverage each other's set of metrics and make that part really easy so that you focus on your area and we can give you the rest of the data. So where we're trying to go here is that the pieces of Catapult, all those wires are really more just wires and Catapult. So if you're actually contributing code in there, then you're gonna have to learn what TBM is and all that. But like, we're trying to get to this place where when you're trying to work on performance, Catapult has a way for you to slot in that'll be productive for you so that you can be an expert on whatever your domain is, be it GPU or input or latency or you know loading. Um, but that then Catapult kind of helps let you leverage everybody else's contributions. 
Uh, so back to the V8 example, uh, this the, uh, data is awesome, by the way, Camilo and Seth. Um, yeah. we, we love this example. So we decided to, to take it and see if we can take those same web pages and put like the V8 part in some context. Yeah, like we basically were like, look, this is great data, but it's it's from V8, so it's V8's view of the world. And, and you know, for good intelligence and good performance optimization for Chrome, we need to look at things holistically. So let's put it into Catapult. Um, so this is Catapult creating a similar piece of data, and we just got this working. Um, what we're showing here is blue is V8, and it's, it's dense. So the key thing to take away here is this is script time, but also time where we're waiting on the network. So we came up with a heuristic to kind of guess when we're waiting on the network. It's a follow-on to some of our critical path thinking, but a great simplification. And so what we've got here is we've got V8 being a very significant part of desktop top 30, mind you. Um, and then you see off on the right some other things like style. Um, but you know, you can see here very clearly that like we can optimize the CPU to death, and the only thing that'll get better is maybe the bottom trace and maybe that middle one that's Bing. Right? And all the other ones are basically network bound. So we're better off handing those to maybe loading dev and saying, hey, loading dev, can you help us out a bit? But we do want to see the CPU boundness still. Yeah. So like, if we get rid of the red thing there, we recreate the graph. Um, this is the same thing, but zoomed in on just the CPU consumers. And it's all blues because of Google being awesome. Um, but there's V8 in layout and layout. But there are many shades of, of the blues. Major shades of blue. Left shade of blue is, uh, is V8. Uh, the middle one is, I think, layout. Um, and styles off on the right, and I think the red is um, paint. I think it's paint, so like slimming paint kind of stuff. Um, this starts telling us, you know, if we want to do something about CPU boundedness, you know, V8 is a good place to peak, and uh, you know, maybe we should pull in Emil here and beat on him. Um, but that's a whole other story for another day. But one of the things here is V8 is still a monolithic block, and one of the great things about the data from the V8 team was that that, that V8 thing wasn't monolithic. Yeah, so we want to be able to go and make this system pluggable, right? So all the awesome work the V8 team did to get really good breakdowns about what's going on in V8, then everybody can take it and see it. And we can see it in, in this context, we can see it in the input dev context. Yeah, so we put a lot of time over the last couple quarters to get it to the point where V8 can produce traces that drive into Chrome's system and vice versa, so that we actually have one common set of data uh, that we can all work with. And so when you do that and you run it at scale, you get this, which is, again, still desktop. But now we have all of the V8 subsystems and all of the Chrome subsystems. So in this, you can see the layout system and the relationship of layout to, say, V8 callbacks versus ICs. But and that's just somebody's desktop, right? So <laughs> what if we want to run it on Android? I don't know if you've ever tried to run like a really long test on Android. But it turns out that like the battery dies, and then like oh, oh you know all about this step, <laughs> uh, the device stops charging, and all these things happen. So our infra team and our clink test team has done like a tremendous amount of work to get Android devices stable in the lab. So now you can just take all this and then run it in the lab. Here it is on Nexus Five. We could get it on Nexus One or and whatever. And it was funny when we were doing this last night. The, the hard part of this was getting all the all the data and agreeing on what data we wanted to show today. Um, once we got the, the agreement on what data we wanted to show, I was actually getting deluged by Ned, who was running the, the runs, saying, do you want it from this sprot? Do you want it from this machine? Do you want, it, hey, do you want XP here? And I was like, oh, well, hang, on, hang on there. I can't make these graphs fast enough. Um, this is really interesting data, right? This starts showing us real world. But eh, it's still only like uh, 30 pages. 30 so what pages. if we had 100? You're really demanding. Or 1,000. Come on. We could do that with cluster telemetry. Uh, yeah, yeah, but we can even take it to the real world. Yeah, so right now we have a, a thing called Deep Reports, which allows, like, if you're a Googler, you can see the QA team. They're generating real traces, and that has all sorts of, of things that, that the lab doesn't have, right? Like a real network and a real user interacting with it in a very long time frame. So what we're announcing today also as part of Catapult is the trace processor. And this is a long-running thing that just finally paid off, where we can now actually basically take any one of these metrics that you start off as a telemetry one um, and actually run the same thing at scale on real-world traces. Now, they're not traces from real people yet. They can be, but it's a little tricky. But what we can get is these QA people, and what we can get is other places that have collections of traces. And we think this is really, really promising because we can start getting insights about the real world and cross-reference yeah, cross real world the lab and do sort of analyses like that. This is pretty exciting. There's a talk about this tomorrow. Um, but, you know, we just talked about CPU time and network, but 
But it turns out that battery like isn't really 100% correlated with CPU, uh, especially on Chrome. It, GPU uses a lot of batteries. So what if you wanted to run all this same stuff and understand like the battery consumption? We've got this device called the Bator. It does a 10 kilohertz uh, power sampling right at the battery, so it's, it's ground truth. It's not one of these heuristics that can uh, not include certain things. It works on Mac laptops and Windows laptops and Android phones, and we're getting it into the lab. Oh, I, the first one just went up, and we're getting uh, a couple hundred more over the next few months. So this is, again, where the catapult strategy is really to try to make it possible to add lots of different contributors to the ecosystem. So Batter just kind of integrates in. And it was a lot of work, but it does integrate rationally. And so now we can get a trace where this green thing here is the battery data, and the rest is the Chrome trace, all put into one thing. And the temptation here is now, well, actually, pause. You can actually see when, this, when these tasks are running. Can you see that, the spikes? I mean, it's pretty cool, right? But now we can take all of that analysis that we did for V8, supposing that that mattered, and start understanding the power cost of these things, too. So we could start saying, you know, Emil, you're the number one source of power drain. Please fix it, right? If we wanted. He's not here, right? I can beat up on him. This is really, really exciting stuff. And the whole idea with Catapult is we can add more data sources as they come available. And as, as the current priorities of what performance you know, is important changes. So you can go back to all that memory inf memory data that the memory infra team spent all that time getting in, and you can get it into to your project as well and understand the memory impact. It's pretty cool. But. And then uh, going back to the perf surfing and the perf waterfall, as soon as you write your metrics, you get all of this for free. You get uh, the, the telemetry benchmark and the perf dashboard, and it goes into the dash dashboard and the sheriff's file bugs and bisect them. So the whole idea here is we're trying to get to this point where you add a probe, you add a metric, you, you focus on your expertise, and... And we do the rest. That's the hope. Now, you know, tries to do the rest is really the more appropriate thing. Like, this is a grand kind of goal, and we think we need to do this because we think that building a smarter engine really requires us to have intelligence about our product, our total product. Um, so it's a hard mission, though, um, so it kind of, it's, it's starting to work now, and, and so we thought it was okay to share it. But there's a journey to go. Um, and in particular, um, I want to talk about two really tough things that are coming up. Yeah, so the, the big problem is that right now this only works for trace-based data. Um, we want to kind of encapsulate that problem. This is part of the reason we're kind of talking about catapult more, like encapsulate it there so that you don't all individually have to deal with uh, getting these metrics in two places. Yeah, I mean, the thing here is we've 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 got the story pretty well sorted, I don't think done, for trace-based things. But the thing is, when you're building a scheduler, you need the data at runtime. When you're getting UMA, you need the data at all the chromes, or nearly all the chromes. So this whole approach of log all your performance data to a file and then process it later works really great for the cases we've attacked. But when we want to go and attack scheduling and attack real, real big met metric scales, um, the current kind of trace omnibus thing kind of falls apart. So we need to come up with a better solution, and that's going to be a big project um, over the course of this week. And there's a discussion about this called PCU. Um, and also, it's probably a discussion about next-gen tooling, um, where this topic is going to feature pretty heavily, if you're interested. But we still need to get back from the car analogy, the driver of the car, right? What about web developers? Uh, we build this great engine, right? We build this Prius, right? And then you've got a person driving around with their foot on the gas, right? Being a, basically a jerk at the wheel. Um, then we can have this amazing engine. We can have this amazing rendering engine. And it doesn't matter because the drivers are not doing the right thing. So we need to actually work with developers a lot more actively to actually make the web better. This was presented. It's kind of this, this high-level thing of like, we got to get this message out to developers. But this is kind of the traditional thing, dev tools. Uh, talks, you know, Twitter, that sort of thing. I think we want to do a bit more than that. Yeah, so one pr big problem we see, right, is third-party content. This giant, uh, long 400 millisecond task, this is some analytics framework that, that just in injected this stuff into the page. Does the author know? Do they care? Yeah, I mean, we need to kind of, how do we make this completely unacceptable, right? And Or another way of putting it is, how do we make sure that there is no world in which this doesn't get into production without somebody knowing. So uh, we've been, uh, Paul's been working on Lighthouse. That's a, a tool that, that can not only give you the progressive web map metrics, but also give you like some advice and, and uh, data about what you could do better on your web app. So one of the problems that we see is that the performance tools space, the traditional ones, a web page test, page speed insights, um, 
you, you know, lots of the node ecosystem is kind of fragmented right now. They have all sorts of different metrics. It's all kind of of different levels of maturity and different metrics, in fact. Each tool reports different metrics. Uh, you know, the idea with Lighthouse very much is to try to help pull that, that ecosystem together, partly by having the progressive web metrics and evangelizing those, but also by making this library available for other people to use and include in their existing product. I think this will help because basically we want to be able to, the, what is important for performance changes constantly, right? Today it's long tasks, but tomorrow it might be our passive event listeners, right? It changes over and over. And we need to get this point where we land whatever it is that's our performance message this quarter somewhere and it gets out to all of the developers a lot more effectively. So Lighthouse might help here. I yes. don't think it's a complete puzzle though. Yes, so tooling for, the de for development for the lab is really important for getting the message out, but then we also really have to get people to understand what's happening on their page uh, in the real world. And we think that the WebPerf APIs are gonna be really key there because you can have a WebPerf APIs and then it can go into analytics. And people can not only understand how their sites are performing, but also how that, that goes into their business metrics. Yeah, so I've been talking a lot about like a hat on, uh, hair on fire moment. Like CNN shipped uh, a patch that basically made their site really, really janky on Android. They didn't really know. Uh, they didn't know. Um, something within their, they do have monitoring, they do have analytics, they do have people watching their business end of the, uh, of the site. Something needs to be on fire there saying, you've got a problem here. There's, there's something going on on Android, you need to check in. Um, one potential way to, to get that hair on fire moment is to get some very, very high level perf details into the timeline ASAP. Like, hey, you're missing a lot of frames. Hey, you've got a lot of responsiveness problems. Get that into the timeline, get that into Google Analytics and all the other analytics products so that at least people know that they've got a problem and they need to dig in more. It's not the complete story though, and I think we have, uh, amongst all of us, an opportunity to have a real big moonshot discussion about what would be the shape of an ideal performance tooling space uh, for web platform. Yeah, so there's a lot of ideas that have come up. Uh, we have two provocative ones just to kind of get people thinking. So what if we gave web devs access to actual traces from the real world? You know, instead of us giving you ROM and instead of us giving you the local tool, what if we actually let you just see, you know, hey, here are 10 traces from people using your site in India. You know, here are 10 traces from the US people. Really hard at a technical level to figure out how to do that. A lot of personal information kind of constraints that we got to work through. But, you know, a, a tool based around that would be pretty transformative. And it's not something we've actually seen available to all web devs yet. Or what if third parties could actually like really get the numbers on how much they're impacting users? Yeah, I mean, there's this problem, right, which uh, Ojan uh, talked about earlier, which is basically you've got third parties who are incentivized to monitor what they're doing. Um, we saw this with V8, in fact, where V8 was measuring itself, but not itself in context. So you know, we need to get it to a point where V8 uh, and, and all third parties can see their self in context of their embedder so that basically you can be like, yeah, you're using a lot of time, but it's not a big deal because there's this other thing in the big picture that's really eating all the time and vice versa if you're doing it uh, the other way that you know that you're actually causing a problem. Maybe wall of shame, maybe some contextual APIs, you know, lots of ideas there. So that's, that's pretty much it. Um, We'd love to see you know more people working with us, putting their data into our being built as it goes engine. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we want to see people thinking up projects. I think we wanted to provoke some project ideas. So you, yes, we, we have that. the ninety-six project ideas. Yeah, we have this, right. this ninety-six projects that are actually running. And uh, so I thought, you know, why don't we propose some new ones? So what we did is we trained a Markov chain <laughs> on all the projects. Uh, there's it just some, kept going, too. Yeah, there's another like, page. Yeah, we have like a, a couple hundred of them, but, but these <laughs> are the best. I like the uh, sandwich content encoding. There, there's some good ones. So we should build all of these, clearly. <laughs> Let's go back. I like, I like uh, deprioritical. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Rendering a fling up scripts. <laughs> So uh, I, will, I will buy a beer for anybody who actually figures out how to do a project based on one of these. <laughs> I'm very generous. 
Uh, but in all seriousness, there's a lot happening tomorrow on performance. Um, you know, I, I really think everybody already is doing a lot on performance, but you know, keep thinking about how you can be smart, uh, how we can make a smarter engine. Uh, think about how our tools and our technology can help you do that. Uh, think about how we can drive tooling. And uh, that's what we got to say. Yeah. Thank you. I suspect we have ample time, so if there's questions, we can do that. Yeah, over there. Okay. Are all the battery-powered devices, such as laptops and uh, tablets and phones, going to be instrumented in the lab with Bator? Uh, so we're rolling it out slowly. We're, we'll have at first we'll have Mac laptops, Windows laptops, Samsung Galaxy S5, Nexus X5, and uh, Nexus 5X. Nexus 5 and 5X, sorry. Uh, so, and then, so if you're running on a battery, like we'll know if, if you're, we're doing bad things for you or not. Yeah, we'll slowly instrument to more tablets and Android devices, but it should work on almost every uh, laptop out of the box. Cool. Now, the numbers we get back from that are like total current consumption, so they're not immediately actionable. It's like, hey, but, but again, if you look at that trace that we showed... We do have a uh, clock synced in a line with the trace. It's uh, aligned, and so you can actually usually guess. You're like, oh, hey, look, there's a thing running. Right, so we have hopes. I mean, this is early. Nobody's ever done that where you put traces together with battery. We're kind of, I believe, first doing that. So it's gonna be a fun journey on that one. Let's stay tuned. Um, okay, so the aggregation of data by Catapult looks pretty cool, uh, but I was wondering, would it work also for project under development? So I have this long running project that's supposed to improve performance and I want to check whether it actually improved performance as uh, we thought before releasing it. So what are the plans for that? Yeah, so the short term plan is that you can check in with the perf try, job, try jobs anytime you want. Um, we do have a longer term idea where we could run uh, like an experiment against tip of tree and, and just get these really core progressive web metrics, get perf dashboard, dashboard graphs, and then just see when they diverge. So one of the things that we're kind of struggling with as a Chrome team overall is that we got the split between UMA and kind of the, the metrics world, Finch, and then the catapult world. And I alluded to this in, in the purple slide that followed the, the cute octopus. I want to put up the cute octopus. Um, so I alluded to that, but basically, I think we need to get to this world where we actually blend together the two worlds, where we actually start going, hey, what if whenever you made a Finch experiment, it automatically stood up monitoring for your project up until the point that, see, this is cute. I think it's cute. Um, we, we need to get to this point where Finch triggers performance monitoring at all levels, and that we just think about we're working on a performance project, and then we have numbers coming in, and we're happy, right? That's going to take a lot of doing, though, because they're very different worlds, and they come from very different pasts. Yeah, I was more referring to before you can actually launch a Finch experiment, like when you're even in the development part. Yeah, you, you can send it to perf tribot jobs, or you can also turn it in on in the, uh, there's a JSON file that like configures what runs on the bots. But, but just to challenge that, maybe we should be playing with the idea of what, when the right time to do Finch is, right? Like Finch is very much for launching right now, but in some teams in Google, you create an experiment, right, when you have your idea, right? And so you just say, hey, you know, I, I, I intend to experiment, right? I'm not launching this, but I just want monitoring from this point on. So people can use it as a fail fast. Like, is this idea have any merit? And just turn it on and try it. And we really like that, that thought and, and what we might be able to do with it. So I think there's some high level questions that I, I really think we should challenge ourselves on just to sort of check that the status quo is in fact what's right. Because um, the status quo is somewhat organic uh, and not engineered. Um, just sort of thinking about using better uses, usage metrics, um, what thought have you put towards how to uh, monitor that and how to watch for things that aren't Chrome using battery and what, what is the noisiness of that kind of thing? Um, I don't know if there's other, like I know, I know that Xcode does this for uh, iOS, but I don't know how they do, I don't know how you can use that as a metric either. So do you have any, did you investigate how this is used normally in other ecosystems or what you? Yeah, so we're looking into battery metrics a lot. Is Charlie here? He's giving like a whole uh, thing on the Bator stuff tomorrow. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, so we're looking at the metrics. We think something about like uh, average or peak per frame will even out a lot. We can also look at, since it's aligned with the trace, we could look at rail stages like just when idle, uh, what, what battery consumption are we using? What we've seen so far in the lab, uh, we need to, to, to get more data, but it seems actually pretty low noise. We're also adding some debugging data because as you said, power is much more sensitive to background processes. So we need to make sure our lab machines aren't running anything else. And, and this is something that we are really focused on the, in the lab first. Be, because of what you said, it's incredibly noisy to get like an actual user uh, battery data and, and then make sense of it. If we just have like a, you buy a laptop in the store and you, you can't even tell from a battery monitor with all the stuff that's running by default on it whether Chrome is, is running. Key thing though is remember you start out with our stack that we built here with the Chrome trace. So if you see a spike in power, and Chrome's not doing anything, it's a really good signal that there's something else going on. The other thing here is the sampling rate is way higher. So the state of the art elsewhere, there are monsoons, but the state of the art with most people doing power work is to sample of these MSRs that the Intel processors have or AMD. But the sampling rate there is in the seconds range. They just don't update that fast. So kilohertz, <laughs> you know, Yeah, that's kilohertz. why our, our current telemetry tests are so poor, is it? They're mostly based on Android dumps us power metrics and Intel MSRs, and we just can't sample at a rate that, that gives us um, non-noisy So we're, we data. think it's sort of like how, you know, with people who've worked with traces, there's CPU time and there's wall time, and the CPU time is always a very, very good signal, right? We're starting out here, too, in a, I think, more competitive place on, on numbers. I, but, the, the, you know, we have a lot to learn here. It's early days. We just got the stack working. It's going to be a long, a long journey. You know, again, go to Charlie's thing, because I think that's going to be pretty cool. We got a question up front. I wanted to follow up on a previous question. The uh, these long, the big efforts like the please navigate or oil pan or ignition, uh, it's really interesting. Get the information, get the data before it hits the public. The, yeah. the projects are are big. We cannot demand like uh, them to release early and often and get information incrementally. Sometimes it's impossible. And similar thing might happen with the web developers that are just developing, hacking their app, and they're interested in the shorter feedback loop on what's going on. So I was wondering if we could add something into your kind of a moonshot performance uh, initiatives, uh, closing this gap between the shorter interactive cycle of getting performance data in the developer's hand, be it a web developer or a browser developer, uh, and closing the gap to the actual ROM, to the actual uh, running in the wild, making some conclusions uh, based on what we have from the field and mapping it to our internal perf bots to actually project what this action, what is actually going to happen with my change based on That's our internal corpus. Because the disconnect is huge, and like for DevTools is a big, is a huge uh, challenge to, to give advice locally without knowing what's going to happen in the wild and vice versa. So I think what I've what, when I hear that, I think about the fact that we have these two worlds. We've got the push, which is, for our case, six weeks, right? And we'll get real-world signals back on the push, and if you dare to push, right? If you dare to turn on your feature. And then, but that's six weeks. That's a long, long time. And then you've got your, your try bots and your build bots, and that's, that's per commit or even more, more quick. And there's not a lot in between. And short of speeding up the release cycle, which is interesting. It's an interesting question about what we can do in the middle ground. I definitely think we should, you know, I would definitely support sort of some moonshot thinking around there. Uh, at one point there was ideas back with uh, Code Purple of like, let's be able to um, push UMA patches, so changes to Chrome metrics, right, to stable channels so that you could experiment on, on the stable channel more quickly and not wait for a binary push. Um, and one of the things in, in other performance tool spaces is the ability to like, push your metric script to the, the production fleet uh, in a way that doesn't even involve a binary push. So there's some cool stuff out there that other people have that we don't. And, you know, definitely think we could do that just for Chrome. And then there's a whole other question, what should we do for the real world? It's a big space. Okay, we've exhausted everybody. Thanks. We'll be around. Have fun. <laughs>